97.5 K248BR Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 9 p.m. Stay tuned for suspense. Tonight, we take pleasure in bringing you Suspense, a weekly anthology of notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in Suspense. There are certain things that are just archetypically American, like apple pie, baseball, rock and roll. One such piece of Americana is the cook-off, or cooking contest. There isn't a state fair or a holiday celebration anywhere in the country that doesn't have some sort of food-related competition as a centerpiece of the festivities. The focus of each cook-off may vary. Entrees, meats, chili, desserts, baked goods, soups, and so may the stakes, from the million-dollar prize awarded in the annual Pillsbury Bake Off to the blue ribbons handed out in thousands of small towns. But one constant amidst those variables is the fierceness of the competition among normally mild-mannered women and men, and the lengths to which some contestants will go to assure victory may indeed be difficult to swallow. Good afternoon. Can I help you, ladies? Hello. I'm Ethel McRory. And I'm Doris Jean Fowler. We're the official, unofficial welcoming committee, and we just wanted to stop by and say, Welcome, welcome to, to Posyville. Posyville. Oh, why, isn't that nice? Very glad to make your acquaintance, ladies. I'm Pepper Madison. Good to meet you, Mrs. Madison. It is Mrs. Madison, isn't it? But of course. And what's that you have there, Mrs. McGrory? Oh, just a welcome basket for you, filled with some of our simple fare, breads, preserves, a, a mincemeat pie. All homemade, of course. Well, my heavens, it looks simply scrumptious. All homemade, you say? Yeah, Ethel here is quite the cook. In fact, she's won the blue ribbon in the Posyville Fourth of July cook-off three years running. Why, that's just a few days away. Mrs. McGrory, you must feel very confident about your chances. Well, I don't know. Doris Jean here makes quite the shepherd's pie. Oh, horse feathers. Ethel's the best cook in the whole county. Nope. I'm more comfortable in the garden than in the kitchen. <laughs> Why, almost all the ingredients for Ethel's entry are coming right out of my garden. Let's see. There's basil... Rosemary, turnips... Doris Jean, you're giving away my recipe. Won't you ladies come in and have a cool glass of lemonade? This weather is just so hot. It's the humidity. Oh, we wouldn't dream of bothering you while you're getting settled in. Well, why don't y'all come back tomorrow for a nice little luncheon? I'd love the chance to cook for my new neighbors and, and learn all the rich history of Posyville. We'd be delighted. Yes, we'd be delighted. How nice of you to ask. <laughs> Fun. Shall we say tomorrow at 12? It's a date. Can we bring anything? Oh, that's quite all right. I have everything I need right here. Especially now that you and Mrs. McGrory have given me this lovely basket. <laughs> Wonderful. See you then, Mrs. Madison. Until then, ladies. Ethel, what's the matter with you? You were so short with Mrs. Madison, and she seems so nice. Oh, I know. But did you have to accept that lunch invitation? Well, why not? Did you see her hands? Perfectly manicured. I swear I could still smell the red nail lacquer. She probably can't even boil water. 
Now we have to have luncheon. She'll probably serve us Swanson TV dinners off the top of a packing crate. <laughs> Speaking of which, did you get a load of the high heels? Oh. And pearls, no less. Do you think she's unpacking boxes like that? <laughs> yeah, and she probably vacuums in high heels, too. Oh, <laughs> just like June Cleaver. <laughs> okay, so we'll grin and bear it. Just make sure to eat a hearty breakfast before we go over. Right. See you in the morning, Ethel. You're supposed to dab a little of that toilet water behind your ears, not bathe in it. Oh, and you're one to talk. I haven't seen you wearing that much cheek rouge since our junior prom. Well, there's nothing wrong with a lady getting herself a little done up every now and then. A little? Why, Doris Jean, are those the pearl earrings Walt got you for your 30th anniversary? The only time I've seen you wear those is when the governor visited Posyville in 53. It's 12 o'clock on the button. We should get going. We wouldn't want to be late, after all. Are you that excited to have frozen Salisbury steak and peas? <laughs> Let's just hope she knows how to turn the oven on. Otherwise, we really will be eating frozen TV dinners. <laughs> <sighs> well, we shouldn't keep our southern belle waiting. Welcome, Mrs. Fowler, <laughs> Mrs. McGrory. How are you both? Oh, just fine, Mrs. Madison. Yes, we were just discussing how much we were looking forward to this luncheon. <laughs> well, it is my pleasure to be able to host you both. Please come in and make yourselves at home. I just need to check the oven. Checking the oven. Hopefully that means she figured out how to turn it on. <laughs> oh, hush, Ethel. We need to... Would you look at this place, Ethel? I'm looking. I'm looking. She just moved in and she's already unpacked and organized. Why, this house is spotless. And you know how long it was sitting empty after Mr. Kavanaugh, God bless his soul, passed on. Oh, well, that's just the downstairs. She probably just piled everything upstairs so we wouldn't see. <sighs> I suppose you're right. After all, it's not like she's some wonder woman. Ladies, <laughs> luncheon is served. Try not to choke on the frozen peas. <laughs> we have Waldorf salad and shrimp cocktails to get us started. Now, I'll be right out with the main course. What a spread. Oh, anyone can make a salad. And look at the place settings. She probably just saw it in better homes and gardens. It certainly doesn't mean she can cook. And here's our main course. Oh, it smells delicious. What is it, Mrs. Madison? Oh, it's just an old family recipe. Steak and kidney pudding. The crust is so perfectly flaky. Oh, I'm afraid it's nowhere near as good as my mama's. Still, I don't think we'll perish from hunger. Frozen Salisbury steak, huh? Let's just see how it tastes before making any judgments, shall we, Doris Jean? The proof is in the pudding, after all. Right now, though, Dad. Out on another stroll through Songland, huh? I do hope the luncheon was to your liking, lady. Wow. Mrs. Madison, the steak and kidney pudding was amazing. I can't believe we ate the whole thing. Whatever is your secret. Oh, it's the meat. If you start with a young and very tender cut, you can't go wrong. Well, I can honestly say that that was the best meal I've had in ages. Wasn't it, Ethel? It was wonderful, Mrs. Madison. Oh, well, thank you kindly. It was the very least I could do for my new neighbors, especially when you went to all that bother to wear your Sunday finest. Do you like Doris Jean's dress? She made it herself. Oh, Ethel. Doris Jean is the best seamstress in Posyville. 
Why, she sews all the costumes for the grammar school Christmas pageant. Oh, it's lovely. Now, that's the, the Butterick 6015 pattern, isn't it? It's the walkaway dress, right? Why, yes, it is, Mrs. Madison. Do you sew as well? No, just a bit. And you did such a neat job on those seams, Mrs. Fowler. I can see why the children must love your work. Did you make that dress you're wearing, Mrs. Madison? This? <laughs> yes. Really? I don't recognize the pattern. Is it McCall's? Oh, no, it's, it's just a little something I whipped up myself. A little something? Why, it's exquisite. Don't you think so, Doris Jean? Oh, yes, it's beautiful, Mrs. Madison. You should be proud of your handiwork. Oh. Why, thank you, ladies. In fact, Doris Jean here had better look out. This Christmas, it might be you making the children's costumes. Oh, now that's silly. They already have a fine seamstress in Mrs. Fowler. I'm terribly sorry, but I just remembered an errand that I must run before 2 o'clock. Will you please excuse me, Mrs. Madison? Yes, I should be going as well. Oh, well, but of course, ladies. <laughs> but thanks for coming. You're both welcome anytime. And thank you, Mrs. Madison. We both had a delightful time. Yes, thank you. Mrs. Madison, you don't have any children, do you? No, not yet. Why do you ask, Mrs. McGorry? Because of that boy's baseball cap hanging next to the door. Yeah, it's a cap for the Lawry's market team. Oh, <laughs> that. Um, well, I hired a young boy to help me move a few items around the house, and he forgot his ball cap when he left. He'll be back for it presently, I suppose. <laughs> but of course. Well, thank you again. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Madison. My pleasure. Please come back soon. Dr. Charles Mayo once said... Land's sake, Ethel. Well Sneaking in like that? And an it's enough to give a body a heart attack. Did you see this morning's paper? No. After our lunch with Mrs. Madison yesterday, I decided to make a new dress from scratch. I'm working on and it, it make you want to keep your oh, mouth How's it coming along? So what were you saying about the morning paper? To help you do this oh, read easily, this. The House of Squibb has created a safe, mm. effective tooth powder... Fourth of July sale at the Broadway... Half off on ladies' dresses. Oh, that's a low blow, Ethel. Not that, Doris Jean. The article below it. Search underwear for missing posy little boy. Teddy Norton, age two. Look at the photo. Maybe. Nope. Doesn't ring a bell. Oh, is he Vernon Norton's boy? His cap. Look at his ball cap. No more. Why, he's wearing the Lowry's Market ball cap. Same as the one that was hanging by Mrs. Madison's door. Ethel, I, I still don't see what you're getting at. Don't you remember how nervous she got when we asked about the cap? And you know how those kids are about their team uniforms? A boy wouldn't just forget his prize team ball cap. You've never had a boy around the house, have you? <laughs> just what's that supposed to mean? It means that boys lose things all the time, including ball caps. So you don't think that Mrs. Madison had something to do with Teddy Norton's disappearance? What? Oh, Ethel, that's ridiculous. What would Mrs. Madison want with a little boy? Well... What's she going to do with Teddy? Cook him up in a pie like Hansel and Gretel? Okay, okay. Maybe I'm... Oh, hold that thought, Ethel. Hello? Oh, hi, Norma. Yes, she's right here. I'll put her on. It's for you. Hi, Norma. What can I do for you? What's that? She is? She what? Norma, I have to go. Thanks for calling. What was that all about? Norma wanted to let me know that our new neighbor, Mrs. Madison, just signed up for the cook-off. Oh, 
Oh, afraid of a little competition, are we? That's not it at all. But do you know what she's making? No. What? Something she calls kid stew. What? That's right. Kid stew. Oh, Ethel. I, that's just... I mean, the very idea... We don't have a minute to spare. We have to go to Mrs. Madison's right now. But I'm not even dressed. Doris Jean. I am not going out looking like this. Give me 15 minutes to get these rollers out of my hair and slap on some more paint. Look, we... Fine. Meet me out front in 15 minutes. <laughs> You're bringing her flowers? Well, we needed some excuse to stop by, so I thought bringing a thank you bouquet would do the trick. Unless you have a better idea. All right. Let's just do this. Now remember, keep an eye out for anything suspicious. Good morning, ladies. Oh, my, what a lovely bunch of flowers. Yes, we um, wanted to drop by and um, thank you for the wonderful luncheon yesterday. We were so... Oh, I do thank you, ladies. It's ever so kind of you. But I'm afraid I can't talk right now. I've decided to enter the cook-off, and the dish I'm making requires my undivided attention. But we... I'll see you both tomorrow. <laughs> now, thanks again for the bouquet. Did you see what I saw? How could I miss it? That stain on her apron, it looks like blood. Ladies and gentlemen, this year's Poseyville Fourth of July cook-off has been the best yet. And we have just two entries remaining. First up, the blue ribbon winner for three years running, Mrs. Ethel McGrory. This year, Mrs. McGrory has gone with an exotic taste all the way from India. Roast chicken with apple chutney. Mm -mm -mm. And now the judges and myself will sample Mrs. McGrory's dish. So how do you like your chances, Apple? Oh, Doris Jean. How can you even think of some silly contest at a time like this? That poor little Norton boy. I tell you, Doris Jean, it just breaks my heart. But did you see the look on the mayor's face when he chiseled off a slab of Violet Abercrombie's Yankee pot roast? <laughs> this should be my easiest win yet. Ooh, they're about to take a bite. Oh, I can't look. Doris Jean, tell me what they think. Well, ooh, I think the chutney might be a little too spicy for old man Barber. Oh, no. But the other judges seem to like it, especially the mayor. He's nodding his head and smiling like a cat who swallowed the canary. Really? Look for yourself if you don't believe me. Doris Jean, I just couldn't. Oh, for Pete's sake, just look. Well, they do seem to be enjoying it. Like I said, this should be my easiest win yet. But there's still Mrs. Madison's entry. Doris Jean, I am surprised at you. Are you forgetting what's in that kid's stew of hers? One bite and the mayor will be running for the laboratory. Oh, Ethel, shouldn't we tell them? Tell them what? We don't have any evidence to show them. Besides, I want to see that show-off get her comeuppance in front of the whole town. Don't you? Well, did you hear? Gladys tells me Mrs. Madison also designed the dress she's wearing right now. It's time. And now, a late entry by the newest resident of our happy little town, Mrs. Pepper Madison. <laughs> Mrs. Madison's dish is an old favorite of hers called Kid Stew. Oh, 
I can't watch. Then why are you looking right at them? Get ready, Doris Jean. What's going on? If I didn't know better, I'd swear they love it. But, but that's not possible. Well, possible or not, that is what's happening. Oh my word! Is the mayor asking for seconds? We need to find a policeman right now. But you said we couldn't go to the police because we didn't have any evidence. Doris Jean, we have to get justice for little Teddy. And this has nothing to do with the fact that Mrs. Madison is about to win the cook-off. Come on! Oh, all right. Hurry, officers, hurry! Look, Mrs. McGrory! Evel McGrory! Surely you know who I am. I'm the winner of the annual cook-off. You were the winner of the annual cook-off. Officers, we believe a murder has been committed. A murder? Here in Poseyville. Who's the victim? That little missing boy, Teddy Norton. The Norton kid? His parents say he's run away before. He'll come back in a day or two. Oh no, he won't, because Mrs. Pepper Madison killed him. What? What proof do you have? The proof is in that pot of so-called kid stew sitting right next to the judging stand. Kid stew, Mrs. McGrory, have you been hitting the sauce? <gasps> Why? I, I never. Why? There was that time. When... There she is, Mrs. Madison. Arrest her. Officer Ferretti, what's the meaning of this?、Uh, sorry, Mayor, but this lady says that Mrs. Madison here killed a little boy and then cooked him up in that kid stew you're eating. Mrs. McGrory, are you insane? Wait a second. That smell. I know that smell. <gasps> Don't eat that. Holy moly! I haven't had this since I was a kid. Back in Italy before the war, my grandmother would make this for me. Your grandmother cooked people? What? No. This kid stew. It's made from young goat. You know, a kid. What? If you two ladies are quite finished, the winner of this year's Poseyville Fourth of July cook-off is Mrs. Pepper Madison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll be. Actually, you ladies were half right. Only it wasn't the kid stew that had the secret ingredient. It was the steak and kidney pudding I made you for lunch. Now, aren't you glad you had seconds? <laughs> So ends proof in the pudding by John C. Alzadek and Dana Perry Hayes. Tonight's story of suspense. Suspense is produced by Blue Hours Productions. Tonight's drama was written especially for suspense by John C. Alzadek and Dana Perry Hayes. Adrian Wilkinson was Pepper Madison. Christina Joy Howard was Ethel McGrory. Dana Perry Hayes was Doris Jean Fowler. Johnny Francis Wolf was the mayor. Rocky Serda was Officer Ferretti, and Eric Kelly was Officer Hughes. I'm Damon Crawl. Next week at this time, tune in for another study in suspense. Our radio station is about discovery. KPFA's mission is to create alternative news, culture, and public affairs programming that are both fulfilling and unpredictable. Fulfilling, satisfying our listeners' expectations that KPFA will continue to speak truth to power. Unpredictable to constantly surprise and delight you, to inspire every listener to dig deeper and discover something new. That's why people say.
I heard it on KPFA. Somani Sengupta, a veteran correspondent for the New York Times, won the prestigious George Polk Award for Foreign Reporting. She's just published an insider's compelling book on India today. Somani will present her views of the world's largest democracy on Tuesday, March 22nd at St. John's Presbyterian Church in Berkeley, 2727 College Avenue. Advanced tickets available through brownpapertickets.com or supportive independent bookstores. He is one stunningly unique character, this Leonard Pitt, Lenny. His Detroit to Paris to Berkeley life, brilliantly described in his new book, My Brain on Fire, Paris and Other Obsessions, is fascinating. He grew up a total misfit in pre-riddle in Detroit, got himself to Paris, studied mime while living in a garret, becoming an artist, falling in love with the city of light, then Berkeley. Start to finish, Kirkus says, his memoir is a lively, autodidactic romp through a life well-lived in both mind and body. He'll be at the Hillside Club, 2286 Cedar Street in Berkeley, Wednesday evening, March 30th at 7.30. Writer Tom Farber will host this KPFA benefit. There is wheelchair access. Advanced tickets at brownpapertickets.com and our indie bookstores. Full info, kpfa.org, March 30th, Leonard Pitt. Kevin Powell is coming to Oakland, one of the most loved hip-hop political voices in this land. Kevin has profound words for all of us. His new book is The Education of Kevin Powell, A Boy's Journey into Manhood. Eve Ensler calls it a raw, deeply painful account of a life born of poverty, racism, abandonment, and complicated love. As much about a mother as about her son. Unforgettable. Kevin Powell gives fresh testimony to the power of the soul to heal. He'll be at First Congregational Church in Oakland, 2501 Harrison, on Tuesday evening, January 26th at 7.30. There's free parking and wheelchair access at this KPFA benefit. Davy D will host. Advanced tickets available at brownpapertickets.com and supportive bookstores. Please find more information on kpfa.org. For January 26th, Kevin Powell. Marxist economist Richard Wolff provides immediate clarity and depth with a tasty wry edge. KPFA is delighted to present Richard with his new reliably discerning talk on February 10th, Wednesday evening, 730 at Berkeley's First Congregational Church, 2345 Channing Way. This KPFA benefit is wheelchair accessible. Richard will be hosted by Sabrina Jacobs, whose unique show, A Rude Awakening, airs Monday afternoons on KPFA. Advanced tickets available at brownpapertickets.com and at supporting independent bookstores. For this wry evening with a great economist, cutting through the bullfruit, offering a positive outlook, February 10th. Angela Davis says, Mumia Abu Jamal is one of the most important public intellectuals of our time. He offers us new ways of thinking about law, democracy, and power. As usual, Angela is right. This is Walter Turner inviting you to join Angela and Johanna Fernandez and myself as we gather to discuss Mumia and his important new book, Writing on the Wall, Selected Prison Letters. This will happen Thursday, February 18th at 7.30 p.m. at First Congregational Church of Oakland, 2501 Harrison Street. There's free parking and wheelchair access at this KPFA benefit, which is co-sponsored by City Lights Books. Advanced tickets are available at brownpapertickets.com, Marcus Books, and other independent bookshops. Find more information on the KPFA website for February 18th, Gathering for Mumia. Lawrence Ross is coming to Berkeley to discuss his explosive new book, Black Ball, The Black and White Politics of Race on America's Campuses. Lawrence exposes the deep racist traditions throughout America's white fraternity and sorority system. He also describes other racist practices now occurring on college campuses across the country and calls for radical changes. 
KPFA and Hard Knock Radio's own Davey B. will be in conversation with Lawrence on Wednesday evening, February 3rd, starting at 7.30 at First Congregational Church in Berkeley, 2345 Channing Way, just one block from the Cal campus. There is wheelchair access at this KPFA benefit. Get advanced tickets at brownpapertickets.com or at indie bookstores. There's more info on the